Um, yeah. Justin Latif, Janet Wilson and Jane Patterson. <laughs> Jane, I mean, that was probably... What, what, you were there this week. What did you witness? So basically we had the getting to know you couple of weeks after the election where there were some meetings and phone calls and some of those relationships had to be forged because they were practically non-existent. Yes. So uh, they were racing around in Auckland to different hotels and different venues and that was all pretty under the radar. Uh, so then the action came to the capital and that was basically after the final results had been confirmed those talks could start properly. So uh, all the leaders and the negotiating teams all came down to Wellington and as you saw there, um, it was basically the, the different meetings and then starting to get together and nut out some of the, the more details of the deal. So it feels like uh, a lot of the, I mean, with these things, you obviously there's common agreement and there's quite a lot of areas mm. of common agreement actually between all three mm. that they could just say, mm. settle, right, put aside. And then they're going to have some of the gnarlier issues. And I imagine one of those will be the tax plan. And as you saw on that track, um, the foreign buyers ban mm. um, in terms of the tax, uh, the emissions trading scheme, Scheme for New Zealand First, there are a lot of um, areas that will need to be ironed out. So that's that's where they're at now. The National is still negotiating directly with ACT and directly with New Zealand First. Once they're both at a point where they're happy with the deals, they will come together. As David Seymour says, a triangle has three sides, and that's when they'll see the whole deal all together. But we're not there yet. It's so interesting, isn't it? I want to uh, pick up on the tax, um, the tax issue because that's an important one. But also, we saw later in the week, David Seymour and Winston Peters finally mm. briefly get in mm. the room together? Having two meetings. Um, I, I, I'm sensing a pincer movement being formed, that those two sides of that triangle are actually working for their own interests and probably ganging up would probably be too strong a word, but working to advance those interests with national. Well, that is smart politics, though, isn't it, Justin? Because, yeah. you know, what is it? Uh, to get divided, we... Together we conquer, divided we, we fall, fall, or something like that. You keep your enemies close, and you yeah, and so... <laughs> Even your frenemies, yeah. you keep and close. So, but, I mean, it's an unusual. Winston, you know, in the previous negotiations with Labour, he, he didn't involve the Greens, and they were, you know, cut out and essentially were outside a cabinet. So this is unusual in the sense that they're all... It's a three-way, you know, kind of negotiation, and that's unusual... Um, historically and so how that works going forward is going to be really interesting because obviously they want to all be in cabinet. Mm. I'm Isn't wondering, it? I'm wondering if that's, sorry to interrupt, but I'm wondering if that's because of the way the, the coalition talks have been conducted. Um, that we've heard that during the, the Labour Party talks in 2017 that Ardern was prepared to do anything to mm. get a coalition together. Um, uh, does this suggest to us that Luxon maybe has put stricter boundaries and guidelines around what's acceptable and what's not It also acceptable? sounds like ACT have actually been far more... Um, wanting far more, right? You know, as yeah. early as July they were saying, we're, we're prepared to sit outside a cabinet if we don't get certain mm. things. So they've probably negotiated hard, and I think it hurt them politically through the election because yes. they yes, they did. made these sort of announcements that we're not going to play ball if we don't get what we want. I think there's a lot of pressure coming on too. There are lots of different dynamics. So um, Chris Luxon obviously has now been um, given the responsibility of forming a government. He set himself up as a negotiator. Mm. Um, no one wants to go to a second election, so there's always that in the background. Winston Peters and New Zealand First are coming back. He will be wanting to make sure that this term is good for the brand, is good for him, is good for um, his party and can see them into the future. Mm. And ACT is incredibly ambitious. They've been on the opposition benches with big ideas bursting to get them um, into government yeah. so they come in with big expectations and also having been the natural partner or seen as the natural partner for National um, probably feel that they, they should have the inside running a little bit but that's not what's happening in these negotiations because and they, mm. three are needed mm. and that's just straight mm. mathematics as David yeah. Seymour would say. Yeah, so. I think David Seymour has uh, sort of moved, he feels like he's moved with that you know his position hasn't been quite as tough quite as cut and dried. It seems like he is now, you know, he is um, on board with this three-party uh, negotiation. Well, you get to a point, too, where the, the carry-on and the personality politics of the campaign 
um, ceases to be constructive. Yeah. You actually, they have a goal, they have an aim, um, there are expectations again from the public that they act like professionals mm. and act like adults yes. and actually yeah. do the job that they've been given to do. So you, you just have to put some of that aside. Um, it's a very different dynamic from the campaign. You have to draw a line and get on with the, the job at hand. The tax policy is one area that both New Zealand First and ACT have got questions around, particularly foreign buyers, um, as you mentioned, I think, Jane. Um, but actually, that's what National campaigned on them. It's a central yep. campaign promise. They need to be able to do that, and it, and it will only fall on them, won't it, yes. if they cannot get it across the line or done or there's no 752 million magically appearing from yeah. the, this tax. For all the ingloriousness of the numbers, and the numbers were inglorious, th th it is the bottom line. It is the, it is the one thing they mm -hmm. have to be seen to get to be getting over the line. Now, th there is still wriggle room about when they introduce that. There's still wriggle room about... Do you about, think there is? I yeah. feel like... Well, they've yeah. said July, but I think they could... Uh, we're talking about a mini-budget in another month's time. Mm. That's what they promised before yes. Christmas. It's a short runway. They can throw their hands up in horror when they look at the books and go, we never realised how terrible they were. <laughs> Therefore, we are going to have to... We will still introduce the tax cuts, but we've got, we're only going to do it. I think that would invite a lot of scrutiny in terms of the hollowness of saying we had no idea the economy was this bad when that, this is what they campaigned on. And everyone, including David well, Seymour, has been It would shine saying, a light on the dubiousness of their figures as right. well. <laughs> but there's going to be a natural tension because Act has said the, the questions that Act have about this tax plan is the affordability of it. They've yeah. said um, it is, uh, we, want, we want lower taxes. However, you're going to have to cut spending a lot over mm. here and that might be in conflict with New Zealand First, whose some of their policies are actually going to cost quite a lot. Mm. Um, but coming back um, to that foreign buyers ban, um, it would be a partial rollback, obviously taxing purchases, and that is fundamentally in conflict with you know pretty. Um, core New Zealand First principles. Well, it's um, called New Zealand First for that reason, isn't yeah. it? They yeah. voted in the coalition to impose the foreign buyers ban in the yes. first place. So there are, um, you know, there are areas that are going to be pretty difficult. Um, but as Janet said, it's a bottom line for National. It's their mm. centrepiece. And Nicola Willis um, has said that she would resign she if would the tax resign. relief wasn't delivered as promised during the election campaign. I, mean, I so think they should be relieved if they don't have to deliver it because it's it's been it's a policy with so many holes. And this gives them an out. I mean, whether they're prepared to swallow that rat, I don't know. But that I don't I mean, think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a um, you know dicey policy, and it, you know that no one's no you know solid economist has been able to work out how they were going to do it. So this gives them an out. Yes, I don't know if it's one that they will take, Justin, but it, I suppose it technically does does definitely give them an out. Often negotiations too, it feels like it's been a month since the election. We've had, it's only a week since the final result, but often they go slow and then they can go fast mm. because you're doing all the niggly stuff and, mm. you, you know, and then bang, they happen quickly. Do you think we might get a government this week? It's crystal ball gazing, I know that, but it doesn't seem without, outside of the bounds of possibility, does it? Uh, no, it's not. Um, we're crystal ball gazing. I think we need to preface everything we say in that, <laughs> through that lens. Yes. Um, but the friendliness that we've seen being demonstrated between um, Seymour and Winston is, uh, indicates to me that if they can agree, then we're over major hurdles, if mm. you know what I mean. Yeah. But I think you're completely correct. What happens is that they wade through the detail and then things move exponentially and, and go faster and faster and faster. Yeah. There, it, doesn't, it leaves a very short runway, though, doesn't it? Even if we got a government this week until Christmas. And those first 100 days are always seized upon, particularly by new prime ministers, you know, that sort of 100-day energy to get things done, to prove to the electorate, you know, that they're in there um, ready to go and to do the job. It looks like it's going to be disrupted, doesn't it, with the rising of Parliament, the summer break, Kiwis are going to tune out. Will that have an impact too on, I suppose, the energy of the new government? Look, they will use every day that they have and um, to get their 100-day plan into place. Um, Parliament will go into urgency. It'll sit right up until Christmas. So I think, I, I, I'm not sure about public expectations on the nuts and bolts. I mm. think there's definitely an, an interest in what the government's going to look like, what they're going to promise, and maybe people will just go, 
the election's done, the new government's in place, we might just go and um, look at something else yeah, while they yeah. go to Parliament and, and do the nitty gritty. We'll go to the beach. Um, but, you know, look, there are other areas that I think are going to be um, crunchy as well, and that includes, for example, Act's treaty referendum. Yes. Actually, and yeah. this is interesting in terms of New Zealand First and Act maybe getting together, there's um, probably a lot more common ground between them, mm. the national, so mm. they could use that alliance mm -hmm. to, to push national maybe further um, yeah. than it would be comfortable with. Uh, I don't think it'll get to a full referendum, um, but we could see, for example, an agreement. I mean, they've already agreed to, between them, scrap the uh, Māori Health Authority, the RMA, Three mm. Waters, which all have elements. We could see something, for example, like an agreement to not include references to the treaty in future legislation, mm. and very controversially then to go back and maybe remove it from existing legislation. Mm. So they're the kind of strategies, I think, to, as I said, to push national maybe further than, than it's um, a certainly campaigned on. A retrospective move to remove it from existing jur jurisprudence would be v quite radical, mm. can I suggest. And you know? it's I a, totally agree. And it's a big conversation that we haven't had as That a we haven't had as a country yeah. yet. And you know, it's it's outrageous that we haven't had it as a country. You what's know? ironic is that one of the most effective race-based policies has been charter schools. You have mm. you know, uh, the Pacific Advanced School, you have Watia School, which are both um, essentially government subsidised schools where Māori and Pacific are allowed to shape their own solutions mm. and that's an ACT policy and it's worked, it's actually working really well and so it's, it's a funny, the rhetoric and the reality are often very different and mm. so I think you know ACT have painted them, they obviously tried to say these things to win voters but and essentially their political you know, um, ideologies suit probably being more targeted with things like charter schools or having funding iwi health providers directly to deliver services in an iwi appropriate way. So that's sort of the what we see and what we hear might actually yeah. turn out to be quite different. Well, we hopefully don't have very long to wait now. Thank you almost so much for your insight and your analysis this morning, Jane Patterson, uh, Janet Wilson and Justin Latif.